Hello and welcome to Eccentric Earth. I'm your host Amy Walker and joining me this week to delve into a story from history is my guest, Adi Anhang. Hello. Hi Adi, thank you for coming back. I'm glad to be back. I'm I'm sure your listeners were missing me all the time. I'm sure they were. You're always a pleasure to have on. But first thing I have to do this episode is I have to apologize to everyone because we didn't actually have a show go up last week. Um, I had arranged to do a recording and it got moved to later in the week. And then I felt ill and wasn't physically able to sit here reading several pages of notes because my voice was really horrible and my throat really hurt. So I'm really sorry, everyone, but we will try and make sure we're a couple ahead from now on so that if ever I am sick, we can at least put an episode out for you. I'm sure they forgive you. Depends how much they enjoy this topic. If they hate it, they'll probably just never forgive me. Oh, no, then they're going to find out what your address is and just, like, knock down your door or something. I don't know. Do not give out that information, Addy. For the right price. Okay, and Addy's never coming on the show again, so if you'd like to take his place on a future episode... I know where she lives. Joshua Abraham Norton was born on February 4th, 1818, in the Kentish town of Deptford, today part of London. His parents were John and Sarah Norton, who were English Jews. John was a farmer and a merchant, and Sarah was a daughter of a successful merchant. So they just did what everyone else did at that time. Yep, pretty much. There wasn't a great variety in jobs. The family moved to South Africa in early 1820 as part of a government-backed colonisation scheme whose participants came to be known as the 1820 settlers. Working alongside his father, Norton brought land and helped with the construction of Port Elizabeth. After the death of his mother in 1846 and his father in 1848, he sailed west, arriving in San Francisco, possibly in November 1849, at the age of 31. I say possibly because there are conflicting accounts of when he arrived, but it was around that time. There are oft-reported historical claims that Norton arrived in San Francisco on a specific vessel, and they arrived with $40,000 in whole or in part of a quest from his father's estate. He soon turned that into a fortune worth $250,000. And that's $250,000 at the time, not in today's money as well. So how much would that be worth today? You know what, let's look that up. I made Amy do math. Wow. You're looking at around $7.5 million in today's currency. I'm sorry, $7.5 million? Yes. 250000 in 1850. Can I get that estate now? You would like Norton's estate? I would like 7.5 million. Okay, I'm glad you specified that and not that you are after his estate because you haven't heard the end of his story yet. Yes, that would be a bit premature of me. <laughs> You've been on this show. You know how these stories go. <laughs> I know you well enough. We've only known each other for, what, several years to understand that I should probably stay back from these areas. In December... 1852, Norton thought that he saw a business opportunity when China, facing a severe famine, placed a ban on the export of rice, which caused the price of rice in San Francisco to skyrocket from 4 to 36 cents per pound. Whoa. Yep, big increase. When he heard a ship, the Glide, which was returning from Peru, was carrying 2,000 pounds of rice, he bought the entire shipment for $25,000, or 12.5 cents per pound, hoping to corner the market. Shortly after he signed the contract, several other shiploads of rice arrived from Peru, causing the price of rice to plummet to 3 cents a pound. Oops. Yep. 
Norton tried to void the contract, stating the dealer had misled him as to the quality of the rice. From 1853 to 1857, Norton and the rice dealers were involved in a protracted legislation. He is not supposed to be a lawyer, this guy. Although Norton prevailed in the lower courts, the case reached the Supreme Court of California, which ruled against him. Surprise! Later, the Lucas Turner and Company Bank foreclosed on his real estate holdings in North Bay to pay his debts. He filed for bankruptcy and by 1858 was living in reduced circumstances at a working class boarding house. The equivalent of 7.5 million to nothing because of rice. Well, I mean, rice is very absorbent. Apparently now it also absorbed funds. <laughs> yeah, never under anticipate rice. Yes, rice, it will surprise you. You can literally do anything with it. By 1859, Norton had become completely disgruntled with what he considered the inadequacies of the legal and political structures of the United States. On September 17th, he took matters into his own hands and distributed letters to various newspapers in the city. One letter he took personally to the San Francisco Bulletin and handed it directly to the editor-in-chief and said, I order you to publish this right away. Okay, sir. Just to see where you think this might be going, what do you think the letter might have said? People should buy my rice. Okay, yeah, it could be trying to encourage business. That's a, not a bad idea. I think you're going to be a bit surprised, though. Um, I'm going to go with something, something about racism, something maybe because America at that time. Let's see, I've got the actual letter here to read out to you. At the peremptory request and desire of a large majority of the citizens of these United States, I, Joshua Norton, formerly of Algoa Bay, Cape of Good Hope, and now for the last nine years and ten months, part of San Francisco, California, declare and proclaim myself Emperor of the United States, and in virtue of the authority thereby invested in me, do hereby order and direct the representatives of the different states of the Union to assemble in Musical Hall of this city on the first day of February next month, then and there to make such alterations in the existing laws of the Union as may ameliorate the evils under which the country is labouring and thereby cause confidence to exist both at home and abroad in our stability and integrity. So when do you think he hit his head? <laughs> How hard do you have to hit your head to assume you can just declare yourself <laughs> emperor? <laughs> oh, I, I like to include stories that have at least one moment that makes you go, oh, good God, whether it's an amazing thing, a horrific thing, or something that just makes you think, how fucking crazy are people? And I love this one. I've lost all my money. I'm emperor. <laughs> You do know, like, that I I do sometimes literally deal with insane people when I'm on the ambulance. But this guy is just special. Let's go with special. The announcement was printed in multiple papers. Norton would later add Protector of Mexico to his title. Oh, that's, that's nice of him. As the self-appointed emperor... Norton issued numerous decrees on matters of the state. After assuming absolute control over the country, he saw no further need for a legislature, and on October 12, 1859, he ordered a decree formally abolishing the United States Congress. I'm sorry, you make it sound like people took him seriously. <laughs> Did you not know about this period of American history when they were ruled by an emperor? Of course. An emperor who had issues with rice. Yes. How could I miss it? Let's be honest. We'd rather have an emperor obsessed with rice than a president who's obsessed with race. To be fair, yes. Although, both cases do not sound like the best thing. <laughs> One of them at least cares about the Mexicans. That's something, yes. I guess. He is their protector. That's something. Fraud and corruption prevent a fair and proper expression of the public voice. That open violation of the laws are constantly occurring, caused by mobs, 
parties, factions and undue influence of political sex, that the citizens has not that protection of person and property which he is entitled, Norton put in his decree abolishing the Congress. And he's not that far off. He's saying it's very corrupt and it doesn't protect the citizens. So, so far, he's not saying well, yeah, that crazy. But <laughs> it's not like a single person can do something that much about it. Uh, you can if you're emperor. Okay. Sure, he is emperor. And he can rule his padded room however he may like. In an imperial decree the following month, Norton summoned the army to depose the elected officials of the US Congress. Norton's orders were ignored by the army, and Congress Surprise! likewise continued without any formal acknowledgement of his decree, which is such a shame. Oh yes, so surprising, such a shame. Further decrees in 1860 dissolved the Republic and forbade the assembly of any members of the former Congress, which again were ignored. Norton's battle against the elected leaders of America persisted throughout his reign, though it appears he eventually, if grudgingly, allowed Congress to exist without his permission. Hoping to resolve the many disputes that had resulted in the Civil War, in 1862 Norton issued a mandate ordering both the Roman Catholic Church and the Protestant churches to publicly ordain him as Emperor. When the American Civil War began, he even wrote to Lincoln and Davis to propose himself as a negotiator for both parties so that he could bring an end to any hostilities. Neither responded to his letters. Surprise. His attempts to overthrow the elected government having been ignored, Norton turned his attention to other matters, both political and social. On August 12, 1869, being desirous of allaying the dissensions of party strife now existing within our realm, he abolished the Democratic and Republican parties. I have so many... <laughs> you don't seem to be handling this story very well. I think it may be this um, slight issue with a dude declaring himself emperor. <laughs> It it just it could be that I'm not sure. We'll find out. The failure to treat Norton's adopted home city with appropriate respect in the subject of a particularly stern edict that often is cited as having been written by Norton in 1872, although evidence of the authorship, date, or source remains elusive. It said, "Whoever, after due and proper warning, shall be heard to utter the abominable word." Frisco, which has no linguistic or other warrant, shall be deemed guilty of high misdemeanour and shall pay into the imperial treasury a penalty to the sum of $25. Well, that's one way to remake your money you lost. He's very keen that you call places by their proper name. Norton was occasionally a visionary, and some of his imperial decrees exhibited profound foresight. He issued instructions to form a League of Nations, and he explicitly forbade any form of conflict between religions or their sex. Norton saw fit to decree the constitution of a suspension bridge, or tunnel, connecting Oakland and San Francisco. His decrees later becoming increasingly irritated at the lacked prompt of obedience by the authorities. Whereas we issued our decree ordering the citizens of San Francisco and Oakland to appropriate funds for the survey of a suspension bridge from Oakland Point via Goat Island, also for a tunnel and to ascertain which is the best project, and whereas the said citizens have hitherto neglected to notice our said decree, and whereas we are determined our authority shall be fully respected, now, therefore, we do hereby command the arrest by the army of both the boards of city fathers if they persist in neglecting our decrees. Given under our royal hand and seal at San Francisco this 17th of September, 1872. The intent of this degree, unlike many others, actually came to fruition. Construction of the San Francisco-Oakland Bay Bridge began on the 9th of July, 1933. The construction of the Bay Area Rapid Transit Transbay Tube was completed in 69. So the tunnel and bridge he wanted actually got built eventually. 
Okay, I have to ask because I don't think I I totally understood this at this point, but did anyone accept his quote unquote rule as emperor because it sounds like someone is taking his orders? There was some people who who felt certain ways about him and they didn't necessarily see him as an emperor, but they didn't see him as the clearly disturbed individual he is. And we're about to get onto the section about how the public saw him. So hopefully that will clear some of the answers for you. But also, okay, this is the period where they didn't have TV. So I'm guessing this was like their entertainment. Look at this guy saying he's an emperor. Yeah, well, it's either we can go watch Norton be nuts or we can sit at home and drink tea, not talking I mean- to each other. I mean, they're from San Francisco. Their tea isn't very good. Norton spent his days inspecting San Francisco streets in an elaborate blue uniform with gold-plated epaulets given to him by officers of the United States Army. He also wore a beaver hat decorated with peacock feathers and a rosette. He frequently enhanced his regal posture by walking with a cane or umbrella. Now, would you like to see a picture of Norton in his fancy get-up? Okay, now that you said it's the fancy version, yes, I would very much like to see a picture of Norton. Yeah, I'm not letting this dude be my emperor. (laughs) But he looks so good. Why, Why don't you describe him to the listeners? He looks like a per, um, an admiral from a European army with a s- cylinder hat with a peacock feather sticking out of it, the front. He has a sword, and considering he's supposed to be an emperor, unshined shoes. Well, he's a man of the people, Eddie. You know, I'm he's sorry. Out, he's he out wears, there every he, day checking the streets himself. That's a hands-on emperor. But but I'm sorry. He's wearing military regalia. He should at least have his <laughs> shoes shined. That's just not the way you go. But does he not look regal and authoritative and the kind of man you would trust to be an emperor of an entire nation such as America? I would not trust anyone to be an emperor period (laughs) okay but what about if i showed you this picture of him riding a bicycle is that one with like the bicycle that with the really big front wheel unfortunately not i would have loved to get a picture of him on a penny farthing because that would have been hilarious although the front wheel is bigger than the back one it's not quite that kind of bike He looks like a kid who's about to fall off. Yep. And so the listeners are aware of what we're talking about. This is the image that's on the front of the episode. Because it is phenomenal. Wow. Then again, this picture of him as an old man is pretty damn cool as well. Because he looks even crazier. I love the visual aids of this episode. He looks like he's about to run for your elections. (laughs) Where they have to have like the massive debate. For everyone. So you know how you have like the helmet dude? Yeah, he is definitely one of the fringe lunatic parties in modern elections. He's the boot hat guy. (laughs) He's his ancestor. During his inspections, Norton would examine the conditions of the sidewalks and cable cars, the state of repairs of public property, and the appearance of police officers. Norton would frequently give lengthy philosophical expositions on a variety of topics to anyone who would listen to him for even a second. Just one second. Just listen to him for one second, then walk away. Make eye contact with him and he's going to start giving you a whole lengthy debate. Make eye contact with him and you're going to turn into stone. Basically, if you've got any plans and he's walking on the same street as you, forget. I'm sorry I have to miss dinner, honey. Um, The Emperor of the United States just (laughs) started talking to me. During the 1860s and 1870s, there were occasional anti-Chinese demonstrations in the poorer districts of San Francisco. 
Now, demonstrations is a very polite way of saying it. These were, some of these, at least, not all of them, were horrible riots where Chinese people were lynched in the streets and beaten. This this was some really dark, horrible shit. So that, that line saying demonstrations kind of undersells it. During one incident... Norton positioned himself between the rioters and their Chinese targets. With a bowed head, he started reciting the Lord's Prayer repeatedly until the rioters dispersed without incident, saving the lives of the Chinese immigrants. Apparently, Captain Cuckoo Pants is helpful sometimes. It's like, if you've got to go through Emperor Norton to get the people you want, you're going to back down. He's the emperor of the whole nation. Yeah, he's, he's a man of his word. During this period, Norton developed a rivalry with another San Francisco resident, Frederick Coombs, who claimed to be George Washington. What the fuck is in the water? (laughs) Holy crap. I don't know if Jesus came around that same time (laughs) as a talking donkey, I would be less surprised. Coombs wore a Continental Army uniform of tanned buckskin and set up his headquarters at the saloon of Martin and Horton, where he would study maps while planning his campaigns for the Revolutionary War. He was reported to have spent a winter starving himself until he was convinced by concerned friends that the Battle of Valley Forge was long over. In his office as president, he composed letters to the United States Congress and issued proclamations, just as Norton did. During the day, he would often be seen in Montgomery Street, wearing a powdered wig and tricorn hat, and carrying a banner proclaiming himself the great matrimonial candidate. Initially, he and Norton drew equal interest from the San Francisco newspapers, who delighted in recounting their exploits. You know what the good thing about this guy is, though? Mm. Is that at least if you work with him, your job is not going to be boring. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, I suppose if you're doing local news, you want to be the person who's covering Coombs and Norton. Never a boring day. If you work in an office with these guys, your day is going to go on so fast. <laughs> Although short, balding, and overweight, Coombs was pompous and vain and thought himself to be a ladies' man. So he was a fuckboy? He he thought the women wanted him in droves. Why wouldn't they? He's George Washington. I'm sorry, have you seen George Washington? <laughs> the dude had teeth from other people. <laughs> I've not looked up if there's a picture of Coombs dressed as George Washington, because... Oh, good God, there is. This is amazing. So this is the guy Norton's getting in fights with. George Washington looks like Ben Franklin. <laughs> oh, why why do we not have people like this anymore? We do, that's the problem. And the main problem is they have internet access. That is true. Holy crap. Who is the person in the photo with him? I'm guessing a hostage. Both their hands are wrapped around the the flag and you can't see the back like the whole of their arms i'm assuming she's handcuffed to him hey lady wanna ha- take a photo with george washington get away from me creep i'm on the one dollar bill norton frequently tore down posters that coombs had put up in, Mon- in montgomery street and coombs often reported him to the police as it was not a criminal offense the police told him they could do nothing So in an attempt to raise funds for a civil action, he sold his story to the Alta California newspaper. When the reporter asked him why Norton would have done such a thing, Coombs replied that he, and this is a quote, was jealous of my reputation with the fairer sex. This caused great amusement, and a few days later in Alta California, they published a story mocking both men, in which they reported that the light of insanity could be seen in Coombs' eyes. Yes. (laughs) Norton and Coombs, both convinced of their sanity, demanded a retraction in the newspaper, but Norton also issued his own proclamation against Coombs, in which he ordered the chief of police to 
seize upon the person of Professor Coombs, who falsely called Washington number two as a seditious and turbulent fellow, and to have him sent forthwith for his own good and the public good to the state lunatic asylum for at least 30 days. To be crazy enough to call yourself Emperor of America and believe it, but sane enough to look at the George Washington number two and go, that guy's crazy, you're, you're walking a very fine line there. Well, obviously, you have to be of sound mind to be an emperor. Mm, history would disagree. Yeah, I know. <laughs> Outraged, Coombs left the city immediately, presumably for New York, as in 1868, he was discovered there by Mark Twain, at the time still believing himself to be Washington, and still convinced the effects of his charm on the ladies, <laughs> who he entertained by displaying his legs on street corners. I'm just imagining, like, someone passing by, and he's, like, with his legs on display, and she keeps, and she just thinks, I, I can cook that. Norton was loved and revered by the citizens of San Francisco. Although poor, he regularly ate at the finest restaurants in the city, Restaurateurs took it upon themselves to add brass plaques in their entrances declaring, by appointment to his imperial majesty, Emperor Norton I of the United States. Norton's self-penned imperial seals of approval were prized and a substantial boost to trade, regularly bringing in tourists. I just like the fact that, like, they constantly encouraged this guy. Oh yeah, they, they love, they love him now. He's... He's a crazy, crazy man, but he's their crazy I mean, man. I mean, I assume from what I've heard so far that he's a mellow crazy man, so he's not like a dangerous wackadoodle. No, I, I think he's very much the... He's not, he's not the... But he's also very composed. He's the articulate insane man. So he he's intelligent. Yeah. He's intelligent, but he's unhinged. He strikes me very much as a case of, well, he's happy believing this. It doesn't hurt anyone, and he's quite nice, so just, just leave him to it kind of approach. It's a good thing no one sent him to an asylum. He would <laughs> not fare well there. No play or musical performance in San Francisco dared to open without reserving a balcony seat for Norton. In 1867, a policeman named Armand Barbier arrested Norton to commit him to involuntary treatment for mental disorder. Oh, shit. <laughs> the arrest outraged the citizens and sparked scathing editorials in the newspaper. Stand behind your emperor! <laughs> Pretty much. Police chief Patrick Crowley ordered Norton be released and issued a formal apology on behalf of the police force. He wrote that he had shed no blood, robbed no one, and despoiled no country, which is more than can be said for his fellows in that line. Norton magnanimously granted an imperial pardon to the policemen. All police officers of San Francisco thereafter saluted Norton whenever he passed them in the street. I'm just imagining the police officer explaining to Norton about... His partner is like, this guy's new. Don't don't worry about him. <laughs> yeah. He just he just passed. He just came. Just 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 go. See, and this is another sign that he's a good person because someone who thinks they're the emperor and the highest authority could easily go off the deep end over being arrested. But he took it in his stride and was like, it's OK. You know, give the guy a pardon. Don't blame him. Kind of yeah. approach. In the 1870 U.S. Census, Joshua Norton was listed as 50 years old, residing at 624 Commercial Street, with his occupation as emperor. It was also noted he was insane. Some of the best people are. It's a good thing Norton perpetuates the stereotype. <laughs> I just like that on the census, is like, oh yeah, it's name, age, address. Um, he's emperor and he's mad. So, okay. <laughs> you know what? What can you do? Norton often issued his own money to pay his debts, 
and it became an accepted local currency in San Francisco. Uh, I'm sorry. <laughs> yes. Unrelated, unrelated, but totally related. Did you know why the Secret Service in the United States was formed? Um, I'm guessing it's not because of the events that happened in Wild Wild West. I don't think that was based on true life. I don't think there was a giant mechanical spider. No. Okay. That right. that is not usually why why organizations form. But good guess. Um no, it was actually to protect currency from counterfeiting. Because yeah. there was no way to mass produce money at that time. Mm. It's each, each state issued their own money that was agreed upon and as a way to prevent counterfeiting because it was so easy to just take a piece of paper and doodle something, they created the Secret Service, which ironically was created by Abraham Lincoln and oh. was not supposed to protect the president. So at least they didn't fuck up that job. <laughs> I was going to say, the, the one president who really needed it started it and yes. weren't even there for him. Typical. <laughs> yes, but it is related but unrelated uh, because of the fact that he produced his own currency. His own legal currency as well. Yes, that's, that's the important surprising. Fact. That places in San Francisco, if you came in with a Norton dollar, even if you weren't Norton himself, they would take it as payment. Yeah, I'm like I would totally do that. The notes came in denominations anywhere between 50 cents and $10. Wow. So he would make any amount. It's like, oh, I've got to pay a bill later. It's $4.57. I'll make a $4.57 note. And it Boom. was accepted. Legal. <laughs> the few surviving notes are collector's items today and sell for thousands of dollars. That makes a lot of sense. Yeah, let's be like, if I could own a Norton note, I totally would. Because this guy's I mean, brilliant. I mean, with inflation, the $4.57 <laughs> note would totally be worth a few thousands. Oh, if they haven't taken it out of, like, local law that it's accepted currency, you could totally, like, take it in and exchange it for real money. However, it's more lucrative to own a Norton note. Yes. At this point. I'd rather own the Norton note. The city of San Francisco also honoured Norton. Whenever his uniform began to look shabby, the San Francisco Board of Supervisors bought him replacements. Norton sent a gracious thank you note and issued a patent of nobility in perpetuity for each supervisor. On the evening of the 8th of January, 1880, Norton collapsed on the corner of Californian Street and DuPont Street in front of Old St. Mary's Church while on his way to lecture at the California Academy of Sciences. No, our emperor! His collapse was immediately noticed, and according to the next day's page three obituary in the San Francisco Morning Call, the police officer on the beat hastened for a carriage to convey him to the city receiving hospital. Unfortunately, Norton died before the carriage could arrive. Our emperor! The call reported in its obituary that, on the reeking pavement, in the darkness of a moonless night, and the dripping rain, Norton first, by the grace of God, Emperor of the United States and Protector of Mexico, departed this life. The reign of Emperor Norton came to an end after 21 years. It quickly became evident that, contrary to some rumours, Norton had died in complete poverty. Five or six dollars in small change had been found on his person, and a search of his rooms at the boarding house on Commercial Street turned up just a single gold sovereign, then worth around two dollars fifty. His collection of walking sticks, his battered old sabre, a variety of headgear including a stovepipe hat, a derby and a red lace army cap, an 1828 French franc, and a handful of the imperial bonds he sold to tourists at a fictitious 7% interest. There were also fake telegrams purported to be from Emperor Alexander II of Russia congratulating Norton 
on his forthcoming marriage to Queen Victoria, and from the President of France, depicting such a union would be disastrous to world peace. Also found were his letters to Queen Victoria, and 98 shares of stocks in a defunct gold mine. Initial funeral arrangements were for a pauper's coffin of simple rosewood. Redwood. Bollocks. <laughs> I don't think he had bollocks in, de- in his coffin. Might have. You don't know. I mean, he probably had his own. However, members of the Pacific Club, a San Francisco Businessmen's Association, established a funeral fund that provided for a handsome rosewood casket and arranged a suitably dignified farewell. Norton's funeral on Sunday, January 10th, was solemn, mournful, and extremely large. Paying their respects were members of all classes from capitalists to the pauper, the clergyman to the pickpocket, well-dressed ladies, and those whose garb and bearing hinted of the social outcast. Some accounts say that as many as 30,000 people lined the streets and that the funeral procession was over two miles long. Wow. San Francisco loved the shit out of this guy. Yeah, apparently. Norton was buried in the Masonic Cemetery at the expense of the city of San Francisco. Wait, we're talking about a state, a capitalistic heaven, like, quote, um, yeah, like, not not heaven, but like capitalistic, the most capitalistic place on earth, basically. Mm-hmm. And the city paid for the burial? Yeah. They they wanted Dude. to bury their emperor with honors. Dude, people love this guy. Yeah. Well, imagine if they let this guy be buried like a pauper. 30,000 people would have torn the place to shit. San Francisco's burning. <laughs> San Francisco's burning. In 1934, Emperor Norton's remains were transferred, as were all graves in the city, to a gravesite at Woodlawn Cemetery in Colmer, where they remain to this day. Although details of his life story may have been forgotten, Emperor Norton was immortalised in literature. Mark Twain, who resided in San Francisco during part of Emperor Norton's public life, modelled the character of the king in Adventures of Huckleberry Finn on Norton. That makes sense. Robert Louis Stevenson made Norton a character in his 1892 novel, The Wrecker. Stevenson's stepdaughter, Isabel Osborne, mentioned Norton in her autobiography, This Life I've Loved, where she said that Norton was a gentle and kindly man, and fortunately found himself in the friendliest and most sentimental city in the world. The idea being... Let him be emperor if he wants to. San Francisco played the game with him. Since 1974, there has been an annual memorial service at his grave in Colma, just outside San Francisco. In January 1980, ceremonies were conducted in San Francisco to honour the 100th anniversary of the death of the one and only Emperor of the United States. In 1939, the group E. Clampus Vetus commissioned and dedicated a plaque commemorating Emperor Norton's call for the construction of a suspension bridge between San Francisco and Oakland. The group's intention was that the plaque be placed on the newly opened San Francisco-Oakland Bay Bridge itself. This was not approved by the bridge authorities, however, and sometime shortly after World War II, the plaque was installed at the Cliff House. In the 1990s, the plaque was moved to Transbay Terminal. When the terminal was closed and demolished in 2010 as part of a project to construct a new Transbay Transit Centre, the plaque was placed in storage, where it currently remains. There have been two recent campaigns to name all or parts of the Bay Bridge after Emperor Norton. In November 2004, after a campaign by San Francisco Chronicle, a resolution to the San Francisco Board of Supervisors calling for the entire bridge to be named for Emperor Norton. On December 14th, 2004, the board approved a modified version of the resolution, calling for only new additions to be named after Emperor Norton. Neither the city of Oakland nor Almeida County passed any similar resolution, so the effect went no further. In June 2013, eight members of the California Assembly, joined by two members of the California Senate, introduced a concurrent resolution 
to name the western span of the bridge for former California State Speaker and San Francisco Mayor Willie Brown. In response, there have been public efforts seeking to revive the earlier Emperor Norton effect. One effort, an online petition, was started in August 2013 and calls for the entire bridge to be named the Emperor Norton Suspension Bridge. The Emperor's Bridge campaign is carrying forward the bridge naming effort. The campaign is using the examples of numerous California state-owned bridges that have multiple names to call to call for an Emperor Norton name simply to be added as a second name for the Bay Bridge, rather than the bridge to be renamed altogether. The organisation is exploring the possibility of offering state ballot pro proposition to this effect in 2018, the 200th anniversary of Emperor Norton's birth. So keep your eyes open because the Emperor Norton Bridge might turn up this year. Unfortunately, it's at this point that we lost the end of our recording and the follow-up conversation between me and Addie. Fortunately, because we were able to get through the whole story of Emperor Norton, you do have that part of the episode, but there won't be any follow-up. If you enjoyed the episode, you can follow us on Twitter by going to at eccentric underscore earth. You can find us on Facebook by going to eccentric earth. And you can find us on Instagram under our name, eccentric earth. All of our social media platforms are kept up to date with news and information on new episode releases, as well as being updated with history facts and tidbits of information that we think you'd find interesting. We're also on YouTube as well, where you can find all our episodes, so make sure you subscribe to our channel there, and if you click on the little bell icon, you'll get updated every time a new episode comes out. If you want to write in to us with any suggestions for future episodes or to give us feedback, our email address is eccentricearth at outlook.com. You can find our show on all major podcast providers, so please make sure you subscribe so you don't miss an episode. And please leave us a rating and review because it does help us find new audiences. Thank you everyone for listening and we'll be back again next week. Bye bye. Bye.